Hello folks, this is part of my review series in which I look at some major books published in the past 15 to 20 years and I review them. And especially important books are my focus, some of them old, some of them new, and I'm going to give you a scholarly summary and review. I hope this service is helpful. I'll just say as a caveat that in most cases, the book is much more full than anything I can say in my review. So you can take the review as a sort of recommendation to go read the whole book. So the book under discussion here is by David Dawson called Allegorical Readers and Cultural Revision in Ancient Alexandria, put out in 1992 by the University of California Press. And in the introduction of this book, Dawson discusses three modern understandings of allegory, or I should say contemporary understandings. The first is the traditional or ancient one that texts can and do have hidden meanings that can be drawn out by interpreters or inspired interpreters. The more modern view that everyone is an outsider to the meaning of a text. We never quite get to the meaning, but we are eternally approximating it. And then finally, the postmodern view that there is no meaning and that people who talk about the meaning are engaging in acts of misrecognition. There's simply the search for meaning, the importation of meaning, and that's all that we have. In chapter one, Dawson talks about so-called pagan allegorists. I prefer to call them Hellenic. And in view here is a very important figure, first century reign of Nero, Cornutus, Aeneas Cornutus, Lucius Aeneas Cornutus from North Africa, who writes a fantastic allegorical text called Greek Theology. And I highly recommend this to everyone Basically, Cornutus's idea was that ancient sages embedded philosophical or cosmological truths in myths, including Homeric and Hesiodic myths, and that these poets, namely Homer and Hesiod, embellished these myths later on and introduced distortions, but that the intelligent reader, through the tools of scholarship and inquiry, can uncover the truth in the myths. Now Heraclitus is the other probably first century CE writer also of great significance. Heraclitus is not the more famous philosopher um, back around 500 in Ephesus, but he is writing right when the New Testament starts getting started. And his goal is to defend Homer against his cultural despisers. And to show how Homer, despite what Plato says, is actually a great moral and, uh, well, not just moral, but a an educational source on all manner of topics. So he's a bit like Ion in Plato's dialogue called Ion. Uh, Heraclitus doesn't see a set of pristine sages before Homer. Homer himself is the sage, and Heraclitus is constantly emphasizing that Homer already is the basic standard for young children learning how to read and to interpret Greek culture. He is the, our mother's milk, and so we better make good use of him. Chapter two is all about Philo of Alexandria, the great Jewish sage, who was in turn inspired 
by Aristobulus, Demetrius, and Pseudo Aristeus. And Dawson has a discussion of Aristobulus and Pseudo Aristeus before he jumps into Philo. Basically, Philo learned from his predecessors that Moses was, as in Cornutus, the primeval sage. And this basically the Stoic idea was applied to the Jewish, this Jewish sage, and that Moses was a conscious allegorist, older and wiser than the Greeks, um, by use of a interesting dating system, Philo and his Jewish allies dated Moses before Homer. And so in some ways, um, Moses is the source of Greek wisdom. Philo posits a genetic connection saying that people like Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, and even Orpheus were readers of Moses. Uh, we know that this is chronologically not true, but that is what he believed. And in the course of his interpretation, Dawson goes through the nitty gritty interpretations of Philo, but I think the best basic message is that Philo is dependent on Greek culture. He obviously writes in very fine, very difficult, but also very learned Greek. But in appropriating that Greek culture, I shouldn't say appropriating, I mean, Philo belonged to Alexandria just as much as he belonged to Judaism. But in, in assuming this Greek culture, Philo made it seem like it was actually Jewish and therefore made the assumption of that Greek culture by Jews logical. And Dawson really drives home this point by saying not only is Greek culture Jewish, but for Philo, Greek culture is deficient Judaism because of course, as time goes on, the wisdom of the sages decays and degrades. In chapter three, Dawson turns to Valentinus. Valentinus is a, the, not necessarily and organically connected to Philo, but Valentinus is used almost as a foil for Philo, because whereas Philo was a very patient commentator who always upheld the biblical text and revered it and made very close comments on it, distinguishing himself and his views from the biblical text, Valentinus based his authority and creativity on what Dawson calls experiential knowledge of the divine or vision. And that kind of authority gave Valentinus the power, so to speak, to replace the biblical story with his allegorical reading so that the biblical story disappears in the revision and the revision becomes the new scripture because according to Dawson, uh, Valentinus is the author of the gospel of truth. This is contested, but the gospel of truth becomes the gospel for the Valentinian community and it replaces more or less Genesis, at least according to Dawson. History, time itself is dissolved by the eternal and the self is dissolved into the fullness. And Dawson proposes that this particular mode of allegorizing arose out of Valentinus' own disappointment with history, a very contestable claim, uh, thinking specifically of the destruction of the Jewish community in 117 in Alexandria. Dawson makes the claim that Valentinus subverted Judaism. So in that respect, Valentinus shouldn't much have cared about the destruction of Judaism. Dawson also claims that in the Leighton Brakey theory, that 
Valentinus was a reviser of the Gnostic myth. This too is contested, and so the the historical interpretations of Valentinus here have to be read as outdated in my view, but still this chapter is full of insights which should still be taken into account when we study the reading of Valentinus and there are helpful comments on Valentinus's fragments, especially fragment one about the creation of Adam and his free speech that are excellent contributions to the field. And finally, Dawson turns to Clement, who is for him a kind of middle path or mediating way between Philo and Valentinus. I think it's a pity that Dawson didn't talk about the allegorical interpretation of the Nassene preacher, but I have opportunity to discuss that um, in my reflections on the Nassenes. Basically, for according to Dawson, Clement followed Justin Martyr in understanding scripture as speaking with the single voice of the Logos. And that Logos spoke in both the Old and New Testaments. But there was a progression between Old and New, or law and gospel. Clement believed that philosophers have muted access to the Logos, but in general, Clement was a great critic of Greek myth and tended not to see any truth there at all mostly criticizing it like Plato on moral grounds. Dawson sees Clement as a instance or example of domesticated gnosis. Those are, it's his phrase. Um, and of course, since Clement um, portrayed the Gnostic and thought that gnosis was important for the Christian, um, probably Clement himself would not have appreciated that term, but it is definitely true that Clement was, I think, responding constantly to Valentinus. He also, when he quoted biblical texts, introduced certain adjustments and paraphrases, but he never erased the distinction between the biblical text and his commentary. And this is really a really important point for Dawson. So obviously I can't summarize entirely a 300 page closely argued book that includes both a main text and lots of endnotes, but to give a very, very basic thrust of what Dawson concludes, he argues that in all three figures, main figures that he discusses, Philo, Clement, and Valentinus, they're all allegorists, they're all revisionary allegorists trying to answer their culture and change their culture in various ways in Alexandria. Philo is the most conservative in distinguishing text and commentary because the text itself has um, sacred value. Clement sees the Logos, or the voice of the Logos, as more important than the text. So in some respects, he can blend text in his own commentary. And that Valentinus, we are given to believe, erased the distinction between text and commentary. Again, all this would depend on I think whether one sees Valentinus as the author of the Gospel of Truth, which is highly contested. But I think that basically these are insights that one has to take seriously and make one's own decisions about. So there has been a, an upsurge since 1992 of studies on ancient allegory and in the actually Dawson's book helped to awaken interest in that but 
for further reading which appeared after Dawson in terms of the ancient texts themselves, I really want to recommend two works that talk about the Hellenic context, which is really important for understanding Philo, Clement, and Valentinus. And that is the translation of Cornutus by Boyce Stones and the translation of Heraclitus's Homeric Problems by Russell and Constant. These are books really worth getting. So they are available and I highly recommend them. In closing, I just want to also say thank you to everyone watching this video and watching this series on important books. I hope to release many more videos reviewing important books, and I hope that it will serve as a benefit to you when you are deciding what excellent, good scholarly literature you want to read and spend the money that is worth spending. So all of you take care and I will see you next time.